Okay, so uh, over the past several weeks, we've been in a series called Below the Surface, and we've been studying emotionally healthy spirituality with a book that's written by Peter and Jerry Scazzaro. So if you're in a CD Life group, you've been hearing the Sunday morning teachings, and you've also been able to be in groups during the week where you're really diving deep and having deep discussions. So over this series, I'm sure there's been some, wow, this is awesome moments, and also some, wow, that hurts moments. <laughs> some, whoa, that's supposed to be hidden. That's how I cope. We don't, we don't look at that. <laughs> Pay no attention to the person behind the screen. Uh, but... If you're in, in a city life group, you've also been able to get to know yourself a little better as well as the people in your group a little better. And I'm sure you've had some conversations about things that have gone on in the past, things that are happening right now in your present and hopes for your future. It's been an awesome, um, amazing series. So during that time, we've been able to study Paul, who was emotionally unaware and not cultivating his relationship with God. We were able to study David, who was courageously living out his true identity. Joseph, who was transformed by a very difficult past. Abraham, who trusted God in a dark moment. We saw Jesus embrace God's will in Gethsemane, and we saw Daniel anchor himself in God. Today, we'll see someone model true compassion in scripture. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 10. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to Luke chapter 10. In this passage, we see Jesus teaching, and among the crowd are Pharisees and Sadducees. And they're questioning Jesus, and they kind of have a little bit of an agenda to trip him up in his teaching or to catch him off guard. And so throughout scripture, we often see Pharisees and Sadducees with the common goal of catching Jesus off guard in his teaching. But it is important to know the difference. I feel like we clump them together often. The difference here is Pharisees lived by an Old Testament, the Old Testament law, and also an additional rule of life passed on by oral tradition, religious practices. And those focused on ceremonial washings, fasting, giving, but they were practices that really focused on recognition for good works, and there was some charity that was done, but it was ingenuine. Sadducees, on the other hand, opposed the Pharisees. They did not believe that the oral traditions that the Pharisees were passing from generation to generation, they didn't believe that those were actually revelations from God. And they also didn't believe in um, immortality of the soul, angels, spirits, things like that. So that's the difference there. And in Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, the book, uh, he, he describes these religious leaders like this. He says, they did not link loving God with the need to be diligent, zealous, and absolutely committed to growing in their ability to love people. And I think... I know that I, I'll speak for myself, I know that I come to places sometimes where I'm so focused on loving God and doing things for him and serving and checking the boxes that I sometimes forget to intentionally love people. And it's so, so, so important. I love the wording that he uses here. Be diligent, zealous, and absolutely committed to growing in the ability to love people. It's something that we need to grow in. So we're starting chapter 10, Luke chapter 10, verse 25. It says, one day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Right. Jesus told him, do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions. So he asked Jesus, and who's my neighbor? I want to pause there for a second because it, right away, right after he quotes the scripture, he realizes he wants to justify his actions because even in just speaking the word of God, he realizes that he's not living up to the standard to it. I definitely experienced that conviction reading the word. I'm just like, yeah, this is awesome. I love you, God, but I can't do this. And so that's where he was at in that moment. So 
uh, verse 30 picks up, and Jesus replies there. He says, Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along, but when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road, passing him by. A temple assistant walked over and looked at him lying there, but he also passed on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along, and when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man, but if his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by the bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do the same. Now, there's a few things that we definitely want to pay attention to in this passage. The first one was that the man was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, that area was notoriously known for being dangerous and for robbery happening. The second thing is that the priest and temple assistant, or also referenced um, at times as a Levite, passed by. They saw him, but didn't stop and help. Now, both of these types of men would be considered religious leaders or church leaders, and they would be held to a standard of showing compassion and charity, and would also regularly teach others to do the same. But they passed by without helping. The third is that a despised Samaritan stopped to help. It says despised here because the Jewish people did not associate with the Samaritan people. And it would actually be off common for them to, dis to um, despise and condemn Samaritan people as evil. So this Samaritan man had no obligation and really no logical reason to stop and help this person. He stopped out of sincere compassion. He walked by and he saw the man, not as his race, not as his nationality, not as his culture, not as his history, not as justice to be served, and not as a political agenda. He simply saw him as a life that mattered. He modeled true compassion. And so the two people that should have been the ones to be charitable, to be hospitable, to be compassionate, didn't even stop and give of what they had. But this Samaritan man stopped, gave of what he had, and also gave of himself. And we'll revisit that in a second. But in Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, uh, I saw this in Chapter 7, and I loved how it was put. It says, as emotionally mature Christian adults, we recognize that loving well is the essence of true spirituality. And it goes on to say later in the chapter, many of us believe loving well is learned automatically, that it's just a feeling. We underestimate the depth of our bad habits and what is needed to sustain long-term Christ-like change in our relationships. It's true. A lot of times we, we know that we love somebody and we think that that's enough and that they should see that. But it's something that has to be grown in. It has to be intentional. It has to be nurtured. A couple weeks ago, Pastor Bob McGregor was here, and he preached on Sunday, and he spent some time teaching, and they were incredible sessions, uh, and he focused on um, mental health with us and just kind of training us in some things, and specifically in fear, anxiety, and depression. And what he taught us was we've got to be able to see people for who they are, acknowledge what they're going through, and walk with it, with them through it. Okay, so I was pondering this over the past couple weeks and um, just kind of thinking about how to apply that to my life and how I can recognize those traits that I haven't grown in for some time. And during that time, I ended up listening to a podcast 
uh, by Pastor Rich and Hillary Harris. They're pastors up at the Father's House in Vacaville, California. They're incredible, great leaders, amazing couple, great family, and they're super funny. Um, they have a um, special needs child. Her name is Jane, and their podcast is called It's Okay to Laugh. And the purpose of their podcast is to make people that um, have special needs loved ones feel seen and know and understand that they're not alone, but also for those of us outside of that special needs lifestyle, for us to not feel awkward about it, but to learn. How can we be better um, in situations? And so I'm listening to this podcast, and the episode that I listened to was, I know what it's like to lose your mom. We lost our dog. <laughs> and the subtitle is, how to communicate with people going through tragedy. <laughs> so... Before this podcast was recorded, Pastor Hillary put out a question on social media, and she said, what are some dumb things that people have said to you when you're going through a traumatic experience or a difficult time? And no, this isn't to offend anyone. This isn't to be disrespectful. And remember, it's okay to laugh, but I'm going to read off some of the responses that she got because they're just too good. Uh, the first one was a friend that responded, and the friend had expressed that she had opened up about some depression that she was experiencing. And the response she got from someone was, you don't have depression, you just have an attitude problem. In what world is that appropriate to say to somebody? <laughs> the second one, and I know I'm guilty of this, I know I'm guilty of this, someone will express something difficult that they're going through, and I'll kind of minimize the situation, I'll be like, oh, well, at least it's not something worse. Or at least fill in the blank, didn't happen. That's not helpful in the moment. Like, okay, that didn't happen, but this did. So <laughs> I'm still struggling. Uh, and then the last one, we, I know I've heard this several times. I know everyone in here has heard this. Sometimes when we're trying to console someone in our best intentions, just trying to make somebody feel better, we'll say, God won't give you more than you can handle. That's not true. <laughs> That's actually a complete misquote of 1 Corinthians 10, 13. The fact is, God absolutely gives us things that we can't handle. And that's why we're so desperately dependent on him. <laughs> so let's not say that anymore. <laughs> Uh, so as I was listening to this podcast, um, Pastor Rich and Hillary gave some very practical ways that we can be better at helping people through traumatic experiences and difficult times, and they're just so good. I just want to share them here. It'll be very quick. The first is to be honest. Sometimes we just don't know what to say, and we don't know what to do, and it's okay to admit that. It's okay to admit that to ourselves, and it's okay to admit that to the person that we're talking to. The second is to approach humbly. Instead of coming with assumptions or statements, let's approach with a question. How can I be there for you in this season? What can I do to help? And the third is to not run from it. Don't avoid that person like the plague because they're going through something difficult. Instead, let's sit with them through it. Allow them to mourn. Allow them to grieve. Allow them to feel. And with that closeness, you'll be able to see the opportunity to help. And when you see that opportunity, instead of approaching it with words, let's take action. Let's do something about it. So very practical ways that we can take action for people in difficult seasons is to bring food, give money, offer to clean their house, offer to babysit their kids. And Pastor Hillary put this so beautifully. She said, do what's in your wheelhouse. Do what you enjoy doing, what you're good at doing, what's in your gifting. For example, if someone's vehicle breaks down, they're having a hard time because that's their only car, maybe if you're not a mechanic, don't try to fix their car. <laughs> right? Can I get an amen? <laughs> but maybe you'll offer to give them a ride. Maybe you'll take them some food at work because they can't leave to go get it. Very practical ways that we can absolutely be lights of Jesus, but it doesn't have to be outside of what the Lord has given us grace to do. The point is, and the bottom line is, compassion takes action and loving well is intentional. 
We've got to look for opportunities to be uh, compassionate towards people and love well. And when we see those opportunities, to act in genuine honor. One of our core values here at Church for the City is honor. We will recognize and respect others by encourage, encouraging, appreciating, and celebrating all. We've got to get to the point where we're acting in genuine honor, appreciating people, encouraging people, celebrating each other. And when we're seeing those opportunities to honor people well, we've got to recognize that it doesn't matter if we agree with their politics. It doesn't matter if we agree with their lifestyle. It doesn't matter what they've done to you in the past. It doesn't even matter what you think they represent. It doesn't matter because at the end of the day, we're all that robbed, broken, beaten person on the side of the road. We all needed to be saved. We needed to be loved. We needed to be cared for. We needed that wine that washes us clean and that oil that heals us. And you know what? Jesus himself looked on us with compassion when we were robbed of a relationship with him. We were beaten down by evil. We were broken by sin. And he did more than just ask his heavenly father for mercy on us. He came down from heaven himself. And he gave of himself. He gave his life so that we could be unified with him for all of eternity. That is sincere compassion. Dad preached the message last week, an incredible message on the cross. You know, I might be a little bit biased, but I think we have the best preacher in the whole world. <laughs> He's amazing, and he makes it look so easy. It's not. <laughs> But he taught us that as we grow in awareness of God's holiness and simultaneously grow in our um, awareness of our own sinfulness, the significance of the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ just grows and grows and grows. And we've got to realize as we come to that place where we're recognizing the significance of the cross, the significance of the gospel. We understand that we're no better than anybody else. We're no more righteous than our neighbor. We're no more righteous than our son, our daughter, our coworker, our friend, our parent, whoever it is that's getting on your nerves. We've got to understand we're on the same playing field. It's only when we're emotionally healthy in our spirituality that we're able to be truly compassionate. And we will not be emotionally healthy in our spirituality unless we're committed disciples of Jesus. A couple weeks ago uh, in City Leadership School with our interns, can we give a shout out to our interns? They, they're incredible. They run this whole place, it's cool. <laughs> But we were talking about being a follower of Jesus versus a disciple of Jesus. And the fact is, Jesus had thousands of followers. Thousands of people would follow him around and listen to the things that he had to say. But only a select few were committed disciples. Only a few would publicly declare what Jesus had done in their lives. Only a few found community with him only a few committed to serving with him. But those are the ones that we want to be. In Matthew 28, 18 through 19, it says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples to all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commandments I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. We love that scripture. And it, it's, it's an incredible. It's very empowering. We get to go out and, and make disciples. But how can we go out and make disciples if we're not committed to discipleship ourselves? I am so proud to be a part of a church who's not out just to make followers and stop there. We're out here to make disciples. 
And so I encourage everyone here, I encourage everyone at the sound of my voice to commit to discipleship. Following Jesus is the first step, but we've got to take action to make our next step towards discipleship. So there's a few ways that we can take action. And once we take action, guys, it's very seamless for us to go into compassion that takes action and loving well with intentionality. So these are the practical ways that we can move along in that. The first is to apply practical biblical truths to relationships you have with people who behave and believe differently from you. In this season, it's not hard to find people that behave and believe differently. But there's ways that we can keep our heart in check. There's things that we can ask ourselves to make sure that we're applying biblical principles to these relationships. How can I be quick to hear and slow to speak? How can I be angry and not sin? How can I watch my heart above all else? How can I speak the truth in love? How can I be a true peacemaker? How can I mourn? How can I not bear false witness against my neighbor? How can I get rid of all bitterness, rage, and envy? The second is to be moved with compassion. Guys, little genuine acts of kindness make a big impact. Do not cross on the other side of the road. Allow yourself to be moved with compassion and be a reflection of Jesus to the person in that moment. And the third is to identify your next steps and commit. Fill out that baptism form. <laughs> Dedicate your child to the Lord. Get connected to a City Life group. Join a serve team or how about ask your City Life group leader or your serve team leader what they think your next step might be. There might be a burning passion within you that's ready to release. And you know what? We say amen to that. We want to see you grow in your relationship with God. We want to see you grow more and more in him but we've got to commit to it. It won't happen on accident. We've got to take the next step and commit to it. Uh, I'm gonna tell a story. My dad had the honor and privilege of teaching me how to drive. Uh, in a Yukon, it wasn't even a small car, it was like, it was an SUV. Um, and the, the poor guy, he just almost lost his life several times. I was fine, but he was in danger. And while he was teaching me, he, uh, he mentioned to me that I tend to hesitate on left turns. I was struggling with that. He said, you have all the confidence in the world to get out there in that intersection, but once you're there, you kind of hesitate before following all the way through. You've got to commit to the turn. And I was like, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, yeah, got this, all right. Get up to the next left, left hand turn put my foot on the gas, I was ready for it. I get out to the middle of the intersection and I hesitate again. And this, so it's a left-hand turn. It leaves him in full-on traffic. So I'm just like, oh gosh, oh, I don't know if I should go. There's cars coming. And he's in the passenger seat yelling, commit, commit. So guys, if you've already decided to follow Jesus, that's awesome. But you're in the middle of the intersection. You've got to take that next step. You've got to commit to it. You guys get it. I don't need to yell it again. First service, I had to yell it twice. <laughs> so it all starts with making Jesus the center of your life. Guys, he is the whole entire reason that we're here. But the next step takes in intention. So in just a few moments as we close, Karina is going to come up and give you instructions about how to take your next step. And I encourage you to stay put after the song and listen. And if you're uh, struggling in the area of showing compassion or loving well, I invite you to come up and receive prayer. Or if you've never decided to follow Jesus for the first time, come up and, and receive prayer. Any one of the people standing up here that will be standing up here in, right now um, are happy to introduce you to Jesus. So Lord, I thank you so much for this time. I thank you so much for the opportunity to come and hear from you, experience you, and be loved by you and taught by you. Jesus, I thank you that you're such a perfect teacher. We receive everything that you have to say to us. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.